Wesley Ruiz is a prisoner in Texas. If the state has its way, he'll be dead within the hour. This is Execution Watch. Huntsville, Texas, death penalty capital of the Western world, where prison staff is preparing to put Ruiz to death by injecting him with a deliberate drug overdose. During the next hour, KPFT's Execution Watch will air live coverage of the killing in Texas, the state that has carried out a third of U.S. executions. Execution Watch host Marlo Blue, criminal defense attorneys Larry Douglas and Pat McCann, Huntsville reporter outside the death house Linda Snyder, and special guests attorney Merrill Portier and former death row prisoner Clinton Young. The execution watch for Wesley Ruiz begins. Hello and welcome to our listeners around the world on this Wednesday, February 1st edition of Execution Watch, held whenever the state of Texas executes a prisoner. I'm Marlo Blue. If you're tuning in for So What's Your Story with Hank Rubichek, KPFT Houston, listen in on Thursday, February 2nd at 1 p.m. They will be back next week in their 6 o'clock time slot. We do this show to bring about awareness of the death penalty, to shine a light on the people caught up in the system, the arbitrary way in which the death penalty is used as a supposed deterrent, and the suffering this all causes to friends and family of everyone involved. Tonight, we bring you live news coverage as the state of Texas plans to execute 43-year-old Wesley Ruiz convicted in the 2007 murder of Dallas Police Senior Corporal Mark Nix. We'll talk about what the Texas Tribune has called the dormant fight over old drugs that is still ongoing. Wesley Ruiz has pending litigation in the U.S. Supreme Court and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals that was filed this morning, although the CCA quickly denied his petitions without written order. We'll discuss the issue of future dangerousness. Also in this show, Execution Watch and Houston Media Source TV conducted an interview with Mr. Wesley Ruiz to be aired on this program in the second half of the show. So stay tuned for that. It's cold and it's wet across the state of Texas today. The sky's been nothing but gray. And joining us is our reporter outside of the death house in Huntsville, Linda Snyder. Hello, Linda. Thank you for joining us today. Any news concerning the replies filed to pending litigation in January by Ruiz, executed inmate Robert Frada and John Ballantyne regarding the use of expired and substandard drugs in Apparently executions the of Texas? The family of Wes is going into the death house. So we are Those seeing. Of us who are out here Linda, can you hear us? We yes, the, we're so the, uh, sorry we're that crossing the line. Now they're having to go through this. We're sorry it's happening, and we look forward to the day when Texas does not kill. That's the voice of Gloria Rub. Rub excuse Gloria me. Rubeck. Gloria Rubeck, on the other end on the bullhorn over there, Linda. Uh, describe the scene outside of the death house for us right now. We know that now that, Wes, go ahead. Wesley has a lot of his friends here. Um, right a, out tonight. Can you repeat that please? You broke up. I said, we have a large crowd here for Wesley. They're friends of his. Some did time with him. Some, you know, are just real friends from growing up. And uh, they're here to support the family. And so we have a good show out tonight. Now, oh, this is being called, of course, uh, a cop killing. Is there any law enforcement presence there? I know that they often come oh. and rev. Yes, they are. They've already come through. So we expect a big show when it's over. But they've already come through and tried to run us over, but they didn't. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Wesley. 
Wesley was a very sweet man. I did not visit him, but everyone that I knew that knew him really liked him. He had a lot of friends on the road. And uh, I, I heard nothing bad about him at all. So I, I'm really sad about this tonight. I don't like the killings. It, it really tears me apart. Linda, thank you. I, I know this is just a, a very hard night. Uh, we appreciate you being our eyewitness and letting us know what's going on. And please let us know when you see the family coming back across the road. I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Joining us to put this case in perspective is our chief legal analyst, Larry B. Douglas, special guest, criminal defense attorney, Patrick McCann, criminal defense attorney specializing in capital cases, Merrill Pontier, and special guest, Clinton Young, former death row inmate. Larry, lead us off. Tell us what happened here. Well, Marlo, as you know, this this case occurred back in 2007. Uh, and at that time, uh, Wester Ruiz was a 11th grade dropout who was working as a truck driver. Uh, he had never been to prison before. Uh, was rumored to be uh, a gang member and a uh, drug dealer, but had never been to prison before. And uh, this is in March, March 21st, two days before this incident, uh, there was a murder and a, a, a Chevy Caprice uh, was seen near the scene of the murder. And so a bulletin went, went out saying, you know, be on the lookout for this Chevy Caprice. Uh, it is somehow tied to the murder that had, had occurred. Uh, then on, on the 23rd, um, an undercover officer noticed the Chevy Caprice. So the plainclothes officer called in the, the fact that he's seen it uh, to, to uniform officers. And so several uniform officers responded, um, in, including um, the, the, the corporal, uh, 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 Mark Nix, uh, and they gave chase. It is reported that, that uh, Ruiz sort of toyed with him a little bit acted like he was gonna stop, and then took off some more and acted like he was gonna stop. And it sped off, going really fast. And he, he uh, missed a curve. And the car slid around and then went down an embankment backwards and got stopped by a fence. Okay, so uh, Corporal Nix followed him right down. So uh, uh, Ruiz's car was pointed toward Nix. Nix just stops his car right hood to hood with, uh, with Ruiz's car. And there was another uh, patrol car uh, following him that followed him down also. So all of this is captured on video, uh, both there, there, there's video of, of everything. So Officer Nix gets out of his car and rather than telling Ruiz to come out, for some reason he runs up and on the car. And uh, the, the second patrol car, parked right next to, near Nick's, Nick's car, near, near the uh, Ruiz's car on the passenger side. So Officer Nix runs up and, and goes on the, near the passenger side. He takes out his baton and starts wailing on the passenger side, front passenger side window, uh, trying to break it. Uh, there is no evidence of him having said anything to Ruiz about come out or anything of that sort. So. He couldn't break it at first, so he takes his service revolver, lays it on the ground, and then comes back and starts wailing on the window with both hands. Uh, and he makes a small crack in the window. And at that point, one shot is fired. That shot hits Officer Nix's badge, shatters, and uh, severs his carotid artery. Uh, at that time, then, the other officers who are there, there are several by this time, uh, they fire several shots into Ruiz's car and they call SWAT. SWAT comes out and gets him out. Both Ruiz and Nix are alive at the time. They're taken to the hospital. Nix dies, Corporal Nix dies. Ruiz recovers. Uh, he goes to trial there. This is in Dallas County. Um, he, um, testifies at trial that he thought, you know, I'm protect, I'm defending myself. So he, he puts on a self-defense argument, which doesn't, does not work. Uh, and he's found guilty 
and, and is sentenced to death. Um, there, there's been some reports that perhaps there, there wasn't a great amount of mitigation evidence that was, that was admitted in, in the punishment phase. Um, but the, the um, future dangerous evidence was, was the thing that, that really was probably the most controversial uh, in this case. Um, but uh, he was found guilty and, and sentenced to death. Um, how important is the question of future dangerousness? Well, it's one of the mandatory special issues that a jury has to answer. Um, I, I would note that the deceased officer had previously, in a high-speed pursuit, shot and killed another um, individual who was under pursuit at that time. Um, so, uh, in, in fairness to um, the startle or the surprise defense that was offered, um, this officer had three people come in and testify at trial, but not before the jury, that he had um, been uh, excessively aggressive um, regarding uh, pursuit tactics um, or refusing to heed a command. Um, Regardless of that, it's hard to argue that um, the officer was clearly in uniform pursuing someone who apparently um, had some kind of uh, contraband in the car and had a reason to try and flee and arguably was armed and did not attempt to surrender at any point. So all of these things are balanced by a jury, but one of the special issues they have to answer in Texas after finding guilt in 2007 um, was, is there a probability that this person would continue to commit um, criminal acts of future danger that um, would be um, dangerous to society? And one of the battles we've always had with um, the prosecution has been whether or not society means prison, society means people at large, um, and in fairness, what makes a person dangerous in the first place, and as Larry said, uh, the young man who was convicted um, had no prior um, criminal history um, of prison. And that's typically, in Harris, that used to be the first um, issue that one would look at as a prosecutor. Can you make a case for future danger? And is there mitigation here that would lead you not to seek death or would make it not likely to get death? Um, and the mitigation question is the second question. The future dangers is evidence that was a dispute here was, if I recall correctly, from a um, psychologist and person who evaluated people for dangerousness named Quejano. And in a number of cases around that time, he had indicated that because of the statistical assertions that um, both Hispanic and black um, defendants typically um, came from a race with a higher um, exposure to risks of gun violence, to assaults, um, that that alone could be a factor in future dangerousness. Now, he was trying to explain this in an academic way that came out sounding like what it sounds like, which is that there's a racist component to assessing future danger. There was also challenges to um, the jury venar for people who apparently got on the panel who arguably from their answers outright held um, anti-Hispanic prejudice. So the worst part of this is that in Dallas, um, there's a long, long history of um, that office's district attorney looking at um, minorities as people who should not be on juries and as people who should have death sought, um, typically. And uh, that was, I think, shown in Miller L. Al, which was a famous case that showed that the Dallas DA's office used to actually take um, training in how to strike minorities uh, from jury panels. So it's, 
it's a case that's unfortunately uh, tinged with overaggressive cops and with racism, honestly. Well, of course, excessive aggression right now in cops is certainly one of the main topics of conversation everywhere that you go at this point in time. Um, and I, I don't really think that's what we need to go into right now, but the murder of Tyree Nichols has definitely put the question of overreach in the headlines again. Do either of you think this will help shine a light on institutional abuse? No. Well, well things are changing already to some degree, to, to a great degree, actually. This is 2007 in Dallas County. Um, right now, Dallas County has a black uh, DA. Uh, Cruzo has been there uh, since, I think, 18, okay. Uh, and um, Dallas County has had a history of, of racism, and so has Harris County. Okay, I, I think the Harris County, um, um, their, the, the guide, the prosecutor's basic prosecutor's guide used to have re references into their, in the guide as to how to go about striking minorities also. But I'm talking about going back to, to, to the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but are things changing? Yes, they are. Are they changing slowly? Yes, they are. But the thing that gets me about this case is the, and the aggressive police, policing uh, is that it's dangerous to the police also. I mean, I, I can't understand why uh, Corporal Nix would have run up on a car like that. Um, and laying his, it, it, it just defies common sense, if, if not, not uh, protocol and, and training. Um, you know, because once the shot is fired, they, they, they wait and, and they, they call SWAT. Well, SWAT should have been the first thing they should have called him again with. Once the guy stops, there's no, he's not going anywhere. Uh, so, so the thing that, that really should have been done is uh, uh, to, to just wait. But, but th things happen the, the way they happen. The, the, the other thing uh, that, that the, the concern for racial understanding is, is, is not just in the district attorney's office, but even in defense counsel. Uh, there, there apparently was quite a bit of mitigation evidence potentially available uh, for for uh, uh, for Ruiz that was not offered. Uh, the, the 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 typical what kind of childhood did he have? Uh, what kind of person was he? I mean, and, and, and he had. Uh, well, I guess he's got two sons now. Uh, that he's been been really trying to, to, to take care of them, giving them advice and so forth, to humanize him. Uh, that uh, for whatever reason in 2007, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to judge a 2007 case uh, in, in 2023 standards, uh, but 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 mitigation, some mitigation evidence would would like, and, and, and it's my understanding. Some some of the reason I did say that that um, some of the jurors, uh, when confronted with uh, some of the mitigation, potential mitigation evidence, uh, said they, they would have given a life sentence a, a little bit more of, a, uh, of, of an airing. Uh, of, they would have considered it a little bit more so, had it been given to them. Now, again, the, the, the lawyers, they tried this case in 2007. Were it tried today, I'm sure there would have been all kinds of mitigation evidence that would have been introduced. Other things to make other um, appearances, as, as it were. Um, can we bring in Clinton Young quickly, Clinton? Did you know Wesley? Oh, yeah, I knew Wesley uh, real well. I knew him when he first came to death row. Um, I liked him. We always got along, right? Uh, uh, he was one of the better ones, right? Um, and uh, I was sad that this is happening. Um, real quick, uh, Larry mentioned he didn't know why like, a police officer would do that. Well, when you use titles like war on crime and it then creates this mindset that these police officers are warriors in this war on crime and that the people that um, they're dealing with are enemy combatants. And you see it on police websites, all the type of T-shirts they have, and they're dressed up like a military guard and whatnot. And um, so it's not <laughs> to me, it's not surprising the officer would uh, do that. I mean, um, it's, and when you're on this side of the fence, it's not, well, I mean, I'm not in prison no more, but we're on this side of having to deal with police. 
nobody is surprised by things like that. And this officer had a, a long history of excessive use of forces and on and on and on. Only three people testified, but I used to go over Wesley's case with him. And um, this officer was like well known for his aggressiveness and assaults and people. And he would do things like assault people in handcuffs and then they would get charged with assault on a police officer, I guess, because he hurt their fist or something. I heard they hurt his fist whenever he punched them or something. I don't know. But um, uh, another thing you mentioned, the videotapes. And this is one of the things that um, Wesley was always talking about was there were some additional videos of the scene that showed what happened. But supposedly Dallas police has a policy that if like the information isn't requested within a certain time period, they basically pick and choose what they preserve. And so um, there was other videos that showed different angles that unfortunately because his lawyer didn't request it in time wasn't preserved and wasn't shown to the jury um but you know back to wesley right um it one of the things that's always bothered me is the way that people like value life for example um, like these motorcycle guys out there that are revving up their motorcycles outside of the unit every time somebody has a cop case is executed. You know, if um, if somebody unfortunately takes a police officer's life, they treat it like it's a, a crime against humanity. But if somebody goes in the hood and they kill four rival gang members, um, none of those same people are out there revving motorcycles or anything like that, right? And it's that kind of stuff that that helps fuel animosity, you know, between the two sides, right? Right. Um, I thought about being present, but I'm going to CDL school right now. That's why I can't be in the studio or actually being at the Walls unit. I'm kind of, actually, I'm kind of glad I'm not at the Walls unit right now. But um, uh, that's frustrating. How does it? Well, Wes, back to Wesley real quick. Is it? You know, I mean, he had, he had a great personality and his family came and seen him all the time. He had his kids. He's always, you know, he's real focused on his family. And um, I know it's hard on his dad because, like I said, he lost his he lost his mother um, shortly after coming to death row. And, you know, the thing about murder and the death penalty and all this is it's just a, it's an entity that ke- continuously gives pain, right? Yeah, really. Um, just, uh, just to mention, by the way, Clinton, that Wesley heard you on our last show and, um, which of course aired very shortly after, um, Elizabeth Stein interviewed him, uh, and he sends a message of support to you, uh, via the email afterwards. So just want you to know that he was still thinking about you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're going to play an, an interview that Elizabeth Stein did for us, thankfully. Um, the, uh, the witnesses have already crossed the road. We believe that the execution has begun. And so now, as promised, we bring an exclusive, uncut, unedited interview with Mr. Wesley Ruiz, as conducted by reporter and producer Elizabeth Stein. Thanks so much for okay. talking to us. I'm talking to Wes Ruiz. Yes. And he's a resident of Texas Death Row. Yes. And uh, he's graciously agreed to speak with us. Um, Wes, how are you doing today? I'm all right. I'm good. Just another day in paradise. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me good? Uh, okay, I can hear you okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway. um, so... Um, Thanks so much for speaking with us. And um, this interview is for you to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So yeah. what do you want to talk about? Um, I want to talk about a lot of stuff, man. Uh, mostly, you know, uh, I've been here for about uh, almost 16 years now. I'll be 16 years this year. Um, and I'm really kind of blessed, you know, that uh, that I had a lot of family in, uh, in my life. And, uh, my wife, my kids, and uh, my brothers, my dad, and uh, even though we had our ups and downs, you know, they've always been in my life. And, you know, um, 
what I want to talk about is like, um, you know, I was in the world. I was, I lived pretty. I was, uh, I grew up in in the streets, man, gang banging, um, and then I escalated to um, hustling and stuff like that. And uh, that's just what I did, right? But uh, it was just a way of life where I come from. It's not necessarily something I thought was bad. It was just something that we did, you know, to get by. But um, you know. I realized, you know, when I came here, I was still kind of messing up when I got here because I had a one-track mind, you know. Um, I had to still had that street mentality for a long time. And uh, But I, I realized, you know, over the years and seeing my, my dad come down here every two weeks, my mom and my kids, that, um, you know, the, the choices that we make, that I made in life, they really, they didn't just impact me like that day that, that uh, I got into this police chase. And uh, I got into this altercation with the cops that uh, I was kind of just being selfish, thinking about myself. You know, I wanted to get away. Uh, I didn't want to get go back to jail again. And uh, so uh, I took it in my hands to try to evade the cops, and it just uh, just escalated into something else. But, uh, you know, those decisions that I made that day, they, uh, they led me to here to see my family come visit me all the time, and they'd be... You know, they love me. You know, they're going to keep coming. And if I get to stay, they're going to keep coming in this. I could see it wearing on, on my family, you know. So I realized that the decisions that I made, man, they, they really impacted more than just me, you know. Where do, where do your family come from? Where are well, they come from come? Dallas. They come from Dallas, most of them, you know. Um, you know, my son's in the military. My youngest son is in the military now, so he comes from by Austin. But, uh. When he does come, that little dude's out there living his own life, which I'm happy, you know, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, yeah, so I, I see my family, man, but, uh, you know, uh, I feel like I owe him an apology because, you know, I was out there in the world, you know, I was, I was keeping it real, what we call keeping it real with my homeboys, you know, with my friends, these dudes I grew up with. And, um, you know, I, I was hustling to take care of my family, you know, to make sure we had a better life. And, um, I did. I was good at what I did, you know. I made a lot of money. And um when you say what you did, what just hustling, you mm -hmm. know, in the streets. And um and I thought that was gonna bring me happiness, you know, but it never really did. You know, I had, you know, the cars, the jewelry, the women, whatever, you know, but man, my family was just being shattered, you know, because I grew up around, you know, the streets, the drugs, everything that's going on and um while I'm making money off of it, it's also destroying lives, you know what I'm saying? Can and, you think of an example of that, the streets destroying lives? Yeah, my family's shattered. I mean, we've been through a lot, you know. Um, and uh, I've seen, I got cousins, and all my homeboys, they've either been in prison, they're dead, or they got out of prison. A few of them are able to, to get back into society and do good, man, and I'm proud of them, you know. Um, one of my good homeboys just came visit me this last Saturday, man, and I, and I grew up with him. And he was actually on this unit with me, but he was in population. And he got out, man, and uh, I was kind of worried, you know, because it's so easy to get wrapped back in that life, but he's doing good, man. And uh, and uh, we were just talking about, you know, that the lifestyle that we grew up in and how, man, that we had this this idea about what it was, you know, keeping it real, loyalty. But, man, ain't nobody really keeping it real, you know. Very few. You got a handful. Like hundreds of homeboys that I had, very few of them kept it real. And I feel what like... What does that mean to you, keeping it real? Ah, just, you know, looking out for one another. Whenever you get in trouble, keep your mouth shut, stuff like that. Like, it's a lot of people that just break. You know, like, my wife, she, she's in, she's incarcerated right now. She got wrapped up in a, in, in a criminal case. And, um, you know, I grew up with all these guys that were tough guys. They're all tatted up. They're gang members, you know. And, and they, they're, they're so easy to flip, to turn. But my wife, she's like 5'2", a little pretty girl. And she's like, has more integrity and heart than all of them, you know. She's like standing up, you know, like just accepting her mistakes in life, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, these kids, they're growing up, man. I really wanted to do more to uh, to reach out to kids, to, uh, you know, kind of get them to leave their life alone because it's like, um, and the culture that I come from, it's, it's, it's glorified, you know, hustling, making money, whatever, the game, man, but it ain't what it's made out to be, you know, when they're rapping on these songs, they're not talking about us in this penitentiary, you know? You got guys in cells that are, that are, they're good dudes, man, but we're not meant to be locked in these cells and they're losing their minds or they're going through depression, anxiety, you know. I got homeboys that are, that aren't on death row, they're just in SEG, friends that I, that are, they're going to be there for the rest of their life. Yeah, because they're, they've been confirmed as security threat groups and they they refuse to go through these programs 
which are considered like programs giving up information and they won't do it. So they're keeping it real with their homeboys, which I mean, I salute them, you know, but uh, at the same time, they're, them same homeboys are just stabbing them in the back and looking for, you know, this, it's not really what it's made out to be, man, you know? What sort of um, choices or things would you encourage younger people to man, have? Man, just do right, man, work hard. You know, it might take a little bit longer to do have a regular job and the money might not be as good, but in the end you get to keep it because when the feds come, they can't take it, you know, because you got W-2 farms and you can prove, you know, I had jobs in life. There's times that I walked away from the game to try to do right when my kids, when my sons were born. And, um, but I just got wrapped back up in it. The money, I was, you know, people, a lot of people are addicted to drugs and I was addicted to, to the hustle. I was addicted to the grind, it's like, it's addicting. What, when you say you were addicted to the hustle, what do you mean? To making money, you know? Yeah, I grew up kind of poor. I grew up in, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of things and I wanted a lot of things. And I saw my other, my older homeboys, man, they were, they were shining, you know? They had the cars and the jewelry and I wanted that. But um, at the same time, by wanting that, man, I let down my, my kids, I let down my family by living fast and living, living a little too hard, you know? And um, I can't change that, you know? So I just try to be the best father and brother and son or husband I could be from this cage. And it's hard, you know? How old are your kids now? <clears throat> my oldest son, he's 27. I got another son, my middle son, he's 21. And my youngest son, he's 20. And I have uh, daughters from my wife, 21 and 23, you know? And uh, I love them all. I miss him. I love my wife and uh, my dad and my brothers. That's mine. That's why I keep going. It's a lot of times that I'll be like, I get tired in here. We get tired, you know, but it takes a real man to admit it. A lot of dudes, they don't want to admit that they go through things in these cages. But, uh, you know, my family's always the reason I kept going, you know, but they be struggling. My kids come and see me. They tell me stories about, man, dad. I ain't got the new J's. All the kids are making fun of me or this and this and that. And I feel like, damn, man, I wish I could be there to help them, you know. And I do in some ways, but in a lot of ways I don't. Because even you, to be a dad on paper or a dad in two-hour visit, it's not, it's not really, you're not really a dad, you know. I try to be, encourage them. That's one thing when my sons were young, they would come visit me. Because I started young in the streets. I was 12, 13 years old. I was already immersed in the light. So when they come visit me, they're like sixth grade. And I'm like, you smoking weed? And he's like, nah, dad. And I'm like, you gang banging? And he's like, man, what are you talking about, dad? I've been playing volleyball. And I'm like, I'm just, you know, I'm worried because I know how fast I got mixed up in that life. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you feel about where your kids are man, now? Man, I'm proud of them. All of them. They're, they're doing, doing good. Well. They didn't get caught up in this life that I did. And I'm glad, you know, and I still, but I still stay on them every day because they like to part, you know, kids are 20. They want to drink and go to clubs and stuff. But um, I encourage them, man, hey, drink, don't get too drunk. Watch yourself. Don't trust too many people, you know. It's sad that this world is as evil as it is, you know, with so many people that are like just out to um, see other people do bad, you know. What do you think is the most important thing a young person can do to a um, avoid getting the lifestyle that they see all around them. How how man, does a kid do that? It's hard. Um, it's so easy to get it wrapped up in it, man. The uh, I don't know, man. Just stay away. Work. Go to school. I wish I was a nerd when I was a kid instead of being a little rascal, you know. Uh, I was always a class clown, always arguing, fighting, being the cool guy. I should have been studying. I should have been paying attention. Listen. You know, that's one thing I can say. I, I can't blame my parents for uh, my mistakes because they always told me, man, those aren't your homeboys. Don't do drugs, stuff like that. But me, I'm hard-headed, man. I'm just, I'm going to do what I want to do, you know. I was addicted to that life, not, you know, just kicking it with my homeboys and doing what I wanted to do. A certain way you kind of feel like you're um, invincible, like you're never going to get caught. But uh, that's what I'm going to tell you is uh, that life that I live, it's only pretty much leads to two, two things. Either you're going to be in this penitentiary or you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be in a casket. You know what I'm saying? And um, that's the reality. I've heard the same thing said of addictions. Yeah, addictions the same thing. You know, it comes with the lie. Everybody's getting high, smoking weed, drinking, drink, whatever, man. Doing methamphetamines, whatever. Everybody's partying, having fun. But you know, it gets to a point to where that fun turns into a problem, and then you don't see it. You're like, man, I got I got. 
bags full of drugs, you know, so I take a little bit out of them, I have some fun, but you know, that's, it becomes a problem, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you mentioned that when you got here, which was 2008, and you were in your late 20s? I was, uh, I got here at 28. Okay, um, that you felt like you still had an attitude about I did, oh uh, man, I was still, I was still really, de uh, you know, uh, dedicated to my, who I was, you know, keeping it real, um, and trying to find, and trying to, you know, help, help out as much as I could. What do you think changed your attitude? Well, I kept doing the same shit, and, uh, excuse me, I kept doing the same thing, and, um, I kept getting in trouble, and then I started seeing, uh, more, I started learning more about different people that were, um, still stabbing me in the back, or people that had given information or stuff like that, and it just made me realize that everywhere, it just made me realize that, man, that's, it's, it's, it's not real, man, and, uh, and, uh, how did you start to change on the inside? My faith, you know, there was one point, man, that, uh, I just got tired, man, and, uh, I started having this, uh, bad, I was kind of down and sad, and a lot of my family was going through a lot, man, and then I just, somebody encouraged me to read the Bible, and I read it, and, um, I got baptized here in 2010, but, uh, I still kept on with my life, but I always kind of talked to God, and, um, he kind of got him, see, even though I was wrapped up in that, I always been a good dude, man, I'm gonna help anybody that I can, that's, that's the thing about me, man, I just, I, I can't, I'm not gonna be shady, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm gonna handle my, I'm gonna handle myself if I have to, but I'm not just looking for confrontation, you know. Um, I don't, I don't like, I don't like that kind of stuff. So when you started to take, to, when you were baptized and you yeah, I just, but I, I get right back up into life. I kept messing up. How did? What do you think turned the corner for you in here? <sighs> Ultimately, man, um, just wanted to do better, wanted different for my kids, wanted to be a better dad. Um, you know, just wanted, to, I got tired of it, you know. What do you mean when you say you got tired of it? The same old thing, you know, the same old thing. Like what? Just waking up and, and, uh, wondering who's really got your back and, and who don't, who's, uh, who's going to keep it real with you, you know, when who are people that really kept it real with me the whole time, most of them are my family. And then when I'm keeping it real with a bunch of other people. I mean, I got I got good friends in here. There's some good solid dudes here, you know. But um, I still I still um uh, I feel like you know my family got my back more than anybody, you know. How unusual is it that you have so much support from your family members on the outside? It's really um that's some there's some other dudes here that got that, but uh, there's a lot that don't. You know, I consider myself blessed. You know, I don't think it's anything I did except for just loving my family. But uh, I just got to, I got to, my family, we've been through a lot, but we always kind of had each other's back, you know. Um, you know, how, uh, how you know, I lost a lot of people. I seen a lot of my family die while I was in here. The mother of my sons, my mom, my, my grandparents, um, uncle. I had a good friend here named Licho. I grew up with him in the streets. He was a little bit younger than me, man. So like when we go to parties, we put him in the trunk. Uh, the car, because he was a little kid, but he was here before me, and he got executed about five years ago. What was his name? Licho Escamilla. But um, I've seen a lot of my friends get executed. I had a lot of family pass away. Just when you keep seeing that, you kind of get numb to the execution, but it also makes you realize that, you know, there's got to be more than life to this, man, you know? And you're never really happy with that kind of life. What, um, what's that like when you... You have a date coming up. What's it like for you? I don't even stress it. I'm not even worried about it. Uh, I, really, um, I worry more about my family, how they're going to take it, my sons. What are you concerned? <clears throat> I just want them to know I'm at peace. I want them to be at peace and, like, move forward. If this goes through, I want them to move forward and be, like, close this chapter in their life and everybody just move forward and know that I'm good, you know? Because I made my mistakes, and this is what happens when you make those mistakes in life, you know? And, uh... What is the attitude of your family? Uh, oh, man. It can't be easy for you to have the date, but how do they react? It's hard for them. They're kind of bumping heads right now over little things, and I'm trying to be the mediator or the voice of reason. But um, I would really like, like, there's been a lot of stuff that happened in my family to where they just, some of them are kind of distant from each other, 
And um, I wish they, I hope that this would bring them all together in the end to kind of like let all that go and just be cool, you know, like give each other a chance again. Because, um, man, in this world, as cold as it is, man, family is really all you got to lean on in the end, you know. You might have a couple friends to keep it real with you, man, but, you know, <sighs> I don't know. I just want everybody to be good and know that I'm good, you know. I'm not really, I don't, I'm not in myself straight. I do the same thing every day. Wake up, pray, work out, jam my radio, read, talk to my homeboys, my people that I'm around, keep it cool, try to keep everybody else, um, encourage you know uh, try to grow as a person um like i say i believe in god but uh i gotta my faith is a little different man than, than the most so. people. well i mean i know i think you know i've always thought that god understood where we come from the environment that we have to inhabit and that that we're gonna have to survive either way you know so i mean while um i believe in god and i, I pray you know I, I can't lie like if somebody gets out of line i'm not gonna hesitate to get in a fight or, or whatever it takes to, um, you know, maintain in this environment, you know, but, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think, I think I'm all right, dude, you know what I'm saying? And that's important to me. Like when I look in the mirror in the morning every day and I get up and I'll be like, man, I could kind of be proud of who I am. You know, even though the mistakes I made, I always try to, uh, keep my integrity intact, you know. That sounds like you've done a lot of thinking about mistakes that you made or I made a lot of mistakes, too many. <laughs> or the decisions that you made and that then, led you here. I'm wondering, um, yep, you say when you came here you still had an attitude of the street. Bad attitude. How, how, are, how is the West of today different from the West that in 2008 came here? <sighs> Let me tell you something, man. This last year I've been through a lot. Like I said, my wife, she was incarcerated, man, and that hurt a lot, man deeply because I, it's a lot that was in, involved in all that and a lot of my so-called homies that uh that uh embarrassed me you know they uh they turned out to be snakes and uh so when that happened i had to reevaluate things you know and i realized hey man i'm done with that so i started reading and man proverbs in the bible and uh I know probably everybody thinks I'm fixing to go all totally religious on them, but I started reading that a little at a time. And, uh, you know, I encourage anybody, even in life, if you're not religious, go read Proverbs a little at a time. That's that's God giving you wisdom in the game of life. So was that in particular proverb, proverb that you found helpful? All of it, you know. But, like, chapter 24 is really good, the whole chapter. It's just talking about... You know how when we're, we're sliding in life, we're quick to react with wrath or we're quick to lash out or we're quick to just do. But hey, man, telling you, hey, man, just sit back and chill. You know, like um, those snakes, those evil people, I'm going to take care of them people, man. You know, and if you do right, you try to be righteous and do good, then I'm going to look out for you. You know, you're going to be all right. You're going to see that like the universe is it's going to take care of itself, you know. And um, it's a lot of things that I don't agree with in, on organized religion, but I know that... Uh, I know that there's a God. I know that there's somebody bigger than everybody else that created us. And uh, Proverbs, it's going to give you... If I would have read that when I was younger in the world, I might not have been here because I was really reckless. But, um, yeah, I, I encourage people to go read that and just, just kind of soak it up, man, because, uh, you know, especially in prison or even in the streets, you live in an environment to where the, you feel slighted and you automatically react to uh, let everybody know, man, I ain't no... I ain't, I'm not weak, I'm not a punk, you know, but uh, in doing that, you know, uh, we create a lot of hard times for ourselves. I spent a lot of times in in the hole, in seg, um, getting shook down, and, you know, just going through hard times. And uh, I could, probably could have avoided a lot of that if I would have been more calm, think think ahead, and uh, just try to, uh, you know, let a lot of stuff go. You know, when people wrong you or slight you, you just, you know, you got to learn to to uh, realize that maybe that person is just going through a lot and um, it's really, you know, a lot of people smile on the outside and do all kinds of uh, scandalous things, but on the inside and they're, they're dying, they're, they're not at peace. And uh, being at peace is, is very important to me. And I'm at peace right now. I'm cool. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I wish we had more time, yeah. but we, we don't edit or cut this interview. Yeah, so. It's already been 20 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Mark says it's been 20 minutes. I just want to let my family know I love them, man, and uh, my sons and my, my daughters, and keep your head up, man, and uh, I'm going to be all right. So I appreciate y'all giving me this time, and all my homies on the road, keep your head up, man. Keep pushing.
Thank you. And say say hi to your homies. Yeah, hi to my friends, all my people that I met all over the world. I got to meet a lot of good people, pen pals that turn into like family, my brothers, my homie in Philly, Beth, Rosemary. Just I met a lot of good people, man. And, it, you know, it's a lot of good people in this world, you know. That's what kind of made me keep pushing, man. So, um, yeah, I thank everybody that uh, was a part of my life, you know. Thank you so much, Wes. I appreciate it. Take care. You too. Keep your head up. That was the final interview with Mr. Wesley Ruiz, heard here in its entirety, unedited and uncut. Now, this will be archived on the Execution Watch and Houston Media Source websites as a final message from the man who will soon lie dead in Huntsville, Texas. You know, the popularity of the interviews that we do are one of the main draws to this show, especially for those of you who are overseas, and, and we know that. The purpose and the reason why we do these is to let our audience experience for themselves the humanity of each condemned person. Keep your head up. Um, I, I'd like to bring uh, Clinton back in here. Clinton, um, you know, I felt like he was talking directly to you. There, there are a couple of things that he mentioned, and, and I would really like to kind of get into them, and one of them was the support of pen pals from all over the world. Did you find that to be true? Or do you still have that kind oh, yeah. of support? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I tell people, right? People ask if I lost faith in humanity because of the negative that's happened in my life. And I always tell them no, because um, going to death row, ironically, it helped me see the best in people. Um, like you said, I mean, I met some great guys down there that unfortunately they're they're still down there um fighting for their freedom right uh, and you know people that wrote me all over the world and helped me i wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for them and so um I, I, yeah, I mean, talk a little bit about people. the support of family and and specifically about the dynamics of of people that you knew on death row, your prison friends, what is that like? Well, I mean, it's like, um, I don't think I that much time, so I'll put up. Um, you know, my family, when I first, one of the biggest mistakes I made when I first went to death row, I was so angry. Like I pushed my family away, my mom, my baby sister. I spent all my time on level three. Um, I really didn't want to come and see me. So I didn't want my mom had to drive three hours to come see me and behind glass. And I surely didn't want my baby sister to see me like that. And um, I was a knucklehead and I was always getting pepper sprayed and use of forces and all that good stuff and uh, fighting the system. And I regretted it because I could have been executed and I would have never got those years back. And, um, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's um, and not everybody has the ability to have, a, not everybody has family members that'll come see him. You know, Wesley, he had, um, his dad and them were, you know, they've been steadfast by his side. And later on in the years, when I calmed it down, um, I started getting a lot more visits, letting everybody come and see me. I noticed that it, uh, it made things better in a lot of ways, but then it also started to like have to face how choices I made in life that put me on the wrong path, how it impacted them. Right. Uh, um, let me take a moment, please, right now to go back to Linda Snyder, who is still in Huntsville outside of the death house. Uh, we'll wait until we can get her connected again. Um, okay. Linda. <laughs> Linda. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the witnesses have now come back across, and so it's over. <laughs> and so it is over. Yeah. Wesley Lynn and the, Ruiz. Go ahead. And uh, the cops, you know, they, they gunned their engines and everything before and, and drove through. And then as soon as they were, he was saying his last words, 
they they started gunning so nobody could hear his last words, his family or anything. His his sons were out here with us, and uh, just you know, it just made it just it's sad. I mean, it's, it's just sad that these police have to act like that. Absolutely, Linda. Well, thank you. So, you're welcome. Uh, get someplace warm, please. Yes, I'm going in the car right now. I'm really, really cold. <laughs> right. Again, that was Linda Snyder. She is our, she's an activist. She is a, a reporter for us outside of the death house in Huntsville, Texas. And she has reported to us at this point in time that the execution is over. Mr. Wesley Lynn Ruiz lies, now lies dead in Huntsville, Texas executed by the state of Texas. You know, uh, California Department of Corrections is in the process of dismantling death row. Gentlemen, is that the right thing for them to do at this time? They haven't executed yeah. anyone in so long. Um, at, at this point, it's, um, if you're trying to deter someone, um, nobody's been deterred in the last two decades for California. Um, if you're trying to have retribution, I don't want. I don't know what point retribution comes at twenty years. Maybe that's solace for some. Um, California has the largest death row in the country. Um, it's qualitatively different from what happens here in Texas because Texas has, with this one tonight, and Frada's um, earlier, there are six more um, scheduled. Uh, one, I understand, may have been stopped because of a lack of notice to his lawyers. And to me, it, it just reflects the fact that we don't do the death penalty well here. And I cannot think of a time when we did, um, and I've been practicing not, not as long as you have, Larry, but I've been practicing almost 30 years doing this, and I can't think of a time when it, wasn't wasn't tinged by racism, politics, sheer incompetence, or some other um, tragic element that made one look at the entire system here in this state and say, uh, you know, we need to do something different. And maybe that'll come piecemeal, but it again tonight uh, we had an execution that was politically driven because it was a cop um, and a cop in the line of duty clearly but also a frightened uh, guy who was apparently um, on drugs at the time and a officer who violated as Larry said every every rule of um, good procedure um, and so another guy dies today, and I'm not sure that gives anybody any deterrence or any kind of um, satisfaction that this was a just retribution. I, I just don't. Does anybody feel better about this? About the is this execution the family? tonight? Is this for the family of, the, of uh, uh, Special Corporal Mark Nix to feel better? Is that what this I, is? I mean, maybe. I, I don't know how you... What do you think, Larry? I, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, we could certainly ask them. I mean, this is something that they wanted. Yeah. But now that they've gotten it, uh, it, what are it they want? I, I don't think it brings them any any kind of comfort. Did anybody lose Merrill or? Uh, we did, and I apologize for that. Merrill uh, Pontier will not be joining us today. Um, a very quick sort of question, if I may, again to Clinton. Clinton, uh, talk about a, a very quick statement please about living in solitary confinement how does it change people i mean like i said it's just there's it's a mental deterioration right uh and i always use an example of like problems ahead on death row that you know these conflicts and i've thought about it a lot since i've been out and recently some something else popped up and uh, made me think about it some more and a lot of it stems from you know we're stuck in themselves and it's aggravating the officers, the wreck, everything, the conditions. They're, they're supposed to be making changes now. Changes are coming to add say. Um, I don't think there are enough changes. Uh, but hopefully it continues, you know, along that path. 
to where they eventually end long-term segregation because it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't help people. You know, it, it, it drives them crazy and they lash out at other people and they lash out at themselves. You know, a lot of times, like, it'd be conflicts on death row. Really, it's, it'd be stupid stuff. Like, I sit back and think about some of the conflicts I have with people, man. And I'm ashamed of myself, right? It's just like, when I walked out that county jail, it was like a, and I got back out in the world and, you know, it was interacting with normal folk. <laughs> it was like a curtain was lifted. And I realized a lot of what it is, is this, it's such a depressing environment and everybody's, you know, frustrated about something. And so they start to lash out at each other, right? And um, at the end of the day, a lot of it really don't mean nothing. But, um, and so it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't do any good. And then there's not adequate services. That's one thing that politicians, judges, law enforcement, everybody universally has been upset about. Not that I'm free because everybody sees and knows I'm working, I'm doing good. Um, I'm living like a productive citizen. But one thing that they're always universally outraged is they just open the door and let me go with no type of services, no type of therapy, nothing. No post-release counseling. And I spent all that time on death row, especially uh, in solitary confinement. And then people know now. I mean, there's been enough stories and news coverage now that, that the average person in society, when they hear solitary confinement, they understand. They know right away drives people crazy. You know? And when they realize that the system is just, they're keeping people like this and just letting them go back into their society, that's what upsets people because they understand that for the most part, it breaks people, you know, and, uh, and, um, you're kind of a tough guy, Clinton. Do you still have nightmares? Well, I still have my moments. Um, it, uh, but thankfully, I, I'm intelligent enough to be able to recognize it. You know, I have enough friends and family around me and homeboys that that been through it, too. That I got people I can talk to, I can go to, that will be there for me. You know what I mean? Right. They'll come over to my, sit down with me, right? But, like, not everybody has that. Some people are, they're left to wander the streets by themselves, right? That's right. Well, uh, it is time for us to wrap up Execution Watch for today. Uh, please join us again on March 7th when Texas plans to usher Gary Green into the death chamber in Huntsville, Texas. If it does, Execution Watch will cover the state-sanctioned killing with our live news coverage. We welcome your opinions on social media and beyond. To learn more about the death penalty and executions in the state of Texas, we're on Facebook at Execution Watch or online at executionwatch.org, where you can also get on our mailing list for all the latest updates. Thank you to our guests, uh, Clinton Young, our panel, Larry Douglas and Pat McCann, death row house reporter, Linda Snyder, executive producer and death row interviewer, Elizabeth Stein, Zara Sox Cooney, social media, KPFT, and Pacifica executive producer and technical advisor Otis McClay, Houston Media Source video director Mel Peterson, and remote producer Mark Pertle. On behalf of the Execution Watch crew, I'm Marlo Blue. Good night.